Were there ever blonde supermen living on the North Pole? The idea is laughable today, um, but uh, in the early 20th century, it wasn't so uncommon for people to believe that the origin of Indo-European peoples could be found in the polar north. This uh, idea was started mainly by an Indian by the name of Tilak. He wrote a theory about the Arctic origins of the Aryan people, and that was based on the Avesta, Avestan writings of the Zoroastrian religion from Iran and on the ancient Hindu writings called the Vedas. Both of these are sacred texts belonging to religions, very old religions, that are from early Indo-European peoples in Asia. And both of them have some things in common about the so-called Aryans, which are the people who founded those religions. The Avesta says that the Aryanem Vejo, that is the Aryan homeland, was destroyed by snow and the cold climate. Doesn't sound like Iran, does it? Both the Avesta and the Vedic sources also say that God, or Brahma uh, in Hinduism, his, that one day for him is the same as one year for us. Tilak thought this referred to the very North Arctic Circle, the Arctic Circle where in the summer the, the sun hardly sets, it's like a whole day for half of the year, and in the winter it's dark nearly all the time. So it's kind of like one year is like a whole day of half in light and half in, in darkness. In the early 20th century and late 19th century that kind of thing was quite compelling argument, but even then it wasn't taken widely as fact. Uh, but it has been very influential on kind of esoteric ideas about or polar origins, and, uh, and even people like Julius Avola have kind of built on the, that kind of thing. From a literal perspective, it does seem quite absurd. However, some more recent scientific developments might make you change your mind on that. As I explained in the video, on Proto-Indo-Europeans. The origins of the Indo-European languages in Europe and in Asia come from a people who were living on the Pontic Caspian steppe in Western Asia, Eastern Europe area. And that this language was associated, is now associated with an archaeological culture called the Yamnaya. The Yamnaya themselves are, are made up from mixes of other much older ancient peoples. And one of these peoples has been identified uh, as something called the Ancient North Eurasians. So the Yemnaya are themselves a combination of Eastern hunter-gatherers and Caucasus or Caucasian hunter-gatherers from the Caucasus. The thing is that both of these people had some ancient North Eurasian blood that contributed to their DNA, so especially the Eastern hunter-gatherers. And the effect was that the Yamnaya people have about 50% ancient North Eurasian DNA. Even modern Brits like me have some ancient North Eurasian DNA. I expect the average is somewhere around 20 or 25%. Modern Brits have about the same amount of ancient North Eurasian DNA as the ancient British Celts did. The Anglo-Saxons had even more actually. But who were the ancient North Eurasians? Well, their genes were originally identified in a paper that was published in 2012. It was called ancient admixture in human history and it was based on the analysis of the DNA of a boy found in Siberia, an ancient boy who was, died over 20,000 years ago. The paper proposed the existence of a group of people with whom this boy was associated called the ancient North Eurasians and this was subsequently proven in 2014 when the genomes of a whole range of Upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherers from Siberia were published, and all of them had this basal population in common, and we scientists now call that ancient North Eurasians. What was really astounding is that every single Europe, every single person in Eurasia has descent from these people in ancient Siberia. Not only that, but all the Native Americans in the entire American continent from the north to the very south are all descended from these ancient North Eurasians. Now, every single one of the samples that was published in 2014 had haplogroup R, and that is 
the ancestral haplogroup for R1a and R1b that are found today. Most of the, in, the early Indo-European peoples coming into Asia were R1a. And the most common haplogroup among modern British people is R1b. So the ancient North Eurasians lived on the mammoth steppe of Siberia. It was not quite the same as it, was, as it is now. It was much more lush and there was a whole range of herbs available on which megafauna grazed. And by megafauna, mainly I'm talking about woolly mammoths. The woolly mammoths died out in Europe long before they died out in, Asia, in, in Northern Asia. And that meant that for a long time, the people there, the ancient North Eurasians, were able to live a lifestyle that had died out in other parts of the globe, which is dependent on the hunting of these huge animals. All of the ancient North Eurasian DNA that we Europeans have comes from these uh, Aryan peoples, who, the Indo-European peoples who came through with the corded ware culture. But in the case of the Native Americans, their ancient North Eurasian DNA comes from long before the Indo-European languages even, because the ancient North Eurasians went over si the, um, Siberia and into Alaska and into the Americas that way. And that's why Native Americans actually have a genetic affinity with Northern Europeans, and it's because of their shared ancient North Eurasian heritage. This is quite similar to what we can imagine ancient North Eurasians look like. These are actually Eastern hunter-gatherers, so a, a, the majority of their DNA was made up of ancient North Eurasian with uh, uh, some other hunter-gatherer DNA. Uh, you can see they're quite robust chaps. All the genes in Europe for blonde hair ultimately derive from an ancient North Eurasian source. However, at present there is no evidence found for blondism among Eastern hunter-gatherers or ancient North Eurasians. This means that they were carrying these genes and that they were later, in the last 6,000 years, perhaps that recent, became much more common uh, through breeding bias events. While the Western hunter-gatherers, from whom the ancient North Eurasians were partly descended, they had blue eyes and dark skin, while the ancient North Eurasians had brown eyes and lighter skin. So as you can see from the, the pictures, they had, they were robust people. They were typically had quite wide faces. You see that among Slavs sometimes today. They look a bit like Russians, actually. Uh, they had strong jaws, long noses, uh, large brow ridges, like Europeans and Australoids, um, more square eye sockets, which is also a common trait among modern Europeans. Um, and they disappeared about 10,000 years ago. Uh, and that was due to their mixing with other populations around the world as they spread out. So while hunter-gatherers in the West had gotten much smaller over time, like Western hunter-gatherers were originally quite tall and, and then they later went, got shorter, this might be because they changed the kinds of animals they were hunting. After the larger animals in Europe died out, in Western Europe, they maybe wasn't necessary for them to be so robust. In any case, the ancient North Eurasians who were descended from the Western hunter-gatherers stayed big and strong. They were very, you know, hardy chaps. And that might be because they had to carry on hunting really big animals like mammoth. And around 10, 12,000 years ago, that's when the habitat of the, uh, this lush herbaceous uh, terrain in the uh, mammoth steppe started to disappear. And with it, the mammoth population and that probably was a major event that forced them to start spreading around and going to other places. And that might explain why they went down into America and into Europe. Now that we know that these, there were these big strong chaps living very quite far north, I mean the furthest north that they lived in Siberia, the, so far that they found the evidence of, in, with DNA evidence, is only, it's, in the, it's directly north of India in Siberia and about the same latitude as Lithuania. That's not that far north, it's not polar north, but if you remember at the, uh, in the end of the last ice age, that was actually a po polar region in many respects. And um, it was, you know, pretty cold and it, it was, it's possible they got forced out by ice and cold, similar to the description in the Avesta. Well, also, you can think about how they carried the genes for blondness that weren't actually present. But when later on, the people who, the first people who started to appear to be fair and blonde, maybe they had some memory of this time of this ancient migration that forced them out by the cold. It's possible. 
And when we have these, when we know that the Aryan language speakers were, had 50% of their DNA from these people who came from the north, it might not be so absurd to think that the early Indo-European Indo language speakers still had some kind of ancestral memory of a migration from the north into the Pontic Caspian steppe before they even started migrating into Asia and Western Europe. Of course, we can't say for certain whether they really had any memory of that. However, I have presented to you the scientific facts, so you can decide for yourself how absurd you think it is. In any case, the polar origin myth is not without merit because there is still the esoteric aspect to consider. Um, but I'll leave that for another video.